Hey there, welcome back. My name is Chris, and today I want to talk about using a coprocessor with the Meadow. First, I'd like to apologize for my voice. I've got a bit of a cold, so I might be sneezing, sniffling, coughing, whatever throughout this. I'll try to get rid of most of it in edit, but that's what's going on. So today what I want to talk about is how do we use multiple computers together in a solution where Meadow is kind of the host or the coordinator of all of the actions. What you would typically call this is using a coprocessor. What I'm going to use for a coprocessor here is an Arduino Uno, so this here. So we've got the Meadow, I'm using the F7. We could be using something like a Project Lab, which has a core compute on it, doesn't really matter. But we're going to be using the Meadow to drive the system and have this do some external processing to unload uh, burden on this. One of the primary reasons you would do this is, as I said, to unload some burden. So let's say you're doing something that requires a lot of intensive CPU. Maybe you're doing a lot of reading and a lot of math. Maybe you need something that is very specific in its timing. The Arduino is really nice because it doesn't have an operating system, so you can guarantee how long some things will take to, to run. You don't have threads going on in the background. You don't have things like network management and a bunch of other stuff that causes things to pause and uh, be time sliced out. On the Arduino, you know exactly how long every uh, line of code is going to take. You can actually measure it. You can decompile it to uh, machine language and figure out exactly how long it takes based on the crystal on the, the Arduino. There are a lot of situations where that might be helpful. Let's say you're trying to drive multiple uh, stepper motors. Let's say you're trying to read a bunch of data in from a signal and do some sort of processing on it, like FFT, things like that. I don't have any specific use case that I'm going to be doing on this. I'm trying to keep it extremely simple. So we're just going to go over the theory of how this would work and how you would do that. The first thing you've got to do is decide how the two boards are going to communicate. The easiest with this is going to be some form of serial. You could either use asynchronous serial, which a lot of people are familiar with, standard serial port. Uh, it's got a transmit and receive, and you send and receive data. We could do that with this project, but to do something a little bit more interesting, I'm going to use I squared C, uh, I, or I2C, also called IIC. It's short for inter-integrated circuit. It is a synchronous serial port. There's another synchronous protocol called SPI or SPI. Could have used that as well. I just chose I squared C on this, honestly, because a customer had asked about how we do this. So I figured it was a good opportunity to show everybody how you can use I squared C clients from a controller that is a Meadow. So first, let's just talk real briefly about what uh, I squared C is. And I mean real briefly. It is a protocol that basically we have two wires. This diagram here shows four, but two of them are power and ground. So we've got a clock and a data. You can have multiple peripheral devices on those same two wire buses. Everything is driven by the controller. It's often called master. I'll call it controller for uh, this video. And then we have a bunch of other devices, sometimes called slaves, I'll be calling them peripherals. The controller does kind of what the name implies, it controls things. It is the thing that drives the clock. So we have a clock and a data line. Any data that is sent on the bus has to be driven by a clock. So you can see, if I come down a little bit here, we've got a clock and a data line. So the controller drives this clock, there are some other things like handshaking, there are starts, stops, acts, knacks. We won't worry about those. There's plenty of online uh, resources that describe how this works in more detail. But what's important is that the controller drives the clock for both directions of data. So if we want to write to a peripheral, the controller drives the clock. If you want to read from the peripheral, the controller drives the clock. So a peripheral cannot send unsolicited data to the controller. It's not possible. You must, from the controller, drive the clock to request data. So that's going to be what's important here. The other important thing is that all of the peripherals have an address. It's a single byte address. 
So theoretically, I guess you could have 250, uh, well, theoretically, you could have 256 of them. Some of the addresses are special use, so I don't think you can get quite that many onto the bus. It's not typical that you would have that many. You know, a dozen, though, I have seen. So we know that we have a controller. We have, it has to drive the clock, and the peripherals have an address. So with that basic knowledge, let's go take a look at how we would use the Meadow using uh, C Sharp to drive an application that will read data from um, Arduino, could be a Raspberry Pi, could be a BeagleBone, could be a microcontroller, whatever. We're going to be reading from an Arduino in this case. It will be our peripheral. We're just going to have some uh, basically simple data. We're just going to read some, you know, uh, contrived data from the Arduino and bring that back uh, into our Meadow system. The next thing I want to talk about is how data is typically laid out on a peripheral. You do not have to actually use this uh, mechanism, but it's very, very common. What you'll have is what are called registers. Think of a register as an address. I hate using the word address because the device itself has an address on the bus. So we use register is an offset into memory. In fact, most of these are implemented just as the data is an in-memory array on the peripheral, and you set the register which is just the offset into that array, and you either write or read to that register. So for our contrived example, we're going to have a device that has four byte registers, and it's going to have three or four registers, depending on how we want to define them. And I've got them defined here, right? So I've got register zero is going to return, and this is just constant data. You absolutely could have this changing. I could have hooked up uh, a potentiometer and, you know, moved it and had the data change. But really, that's all about the electronics. I just wanted to go through the theory of how this works. If you can do this, you can make the data change. But if I read from register zero, I'm going to get this value, register one, this value, register two, this value. And if I try to read from anything other than zero, one or two, I'm going to get this. These are just ASCII bytes that uh, equate to 0, 1, 2, and Xs. It just allows us to know that we are getting data from the peripheral and we're actually getting the data from the register that we think that we should be. So if I say read from register 1 and I get something other than the text 1, I know something is wrong. So what would this look like from the controller perspective? So from the meadow. Again, we're going to use C sharp for this. This is extremely easy. We know that we're using the I squared C bus and here, you know, let's zoom in. You can see that I am running on the feather V2, which is what I had just showed you. All we're going to do is implement a run method. You can see it is what about 20 lines of code, 30 lines of code. We're going to create the I squared C bus. And then I'm going to have two buffers, a transmit and a receive. Remember I said that we're, going to use four byte addresses, but the uh, the controller, it has to drive everything. So it has to send and receive. So what it's going to do is it's going to send uh, a byte that is the register that we want to read and then read four bytes. I could have done this with a five byte buffer and just used an offset into it for read and write, but either one works. The bus address, this is the address on the I squared C bus. You can't have more than two peripherals that have the same address. I arbitrarily picked 42. It could have been anything. You just need to have the controller and the peripheral using the same address, and you can't have more than one device with that address on the bus. So I'm just going to have a loop here. It is going to put a number into the transmit buffer. And so I've just got a counter here, I, that's going to increment. And I'm just going to put in 0, 1, 2, or 3. So that is our register that we want to read. And then I will write that register. That tells the peripheral, this is where I want you to move your pointer to, to this register. And then I read from that same bus address 
and because this buffer is four bytes, it's going to read four bytes back. So we'll read it back. It'll use uh, the ASCII encoder to turn it into text and output it. Then we're going to just wait two seconds and increment I. And if I is greater than three, we just go back to zero. So it'll just go zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. And we should get back when we send a numeric one in, we should get back the text O N E uh, with the null. It's not going to display the null obviously, but that's what we're looking at uh, for behavior. Very, very simple. So what would this look like over on the Arduino side? This is again, rather simple. We've got the bus address. Again, this must match controller and peripheral. Then I have a single byte. This is when the uh, meadow or the controller sends me that single byte that is my register. I want to store that. And then I've got an LED state. I have an LED blinking on the Arduino just to know that the code is running gives us some sort of a visual representation. So in the setup on an Arduino, setup runs one time, and then there's another function called loop that runs multiple times, basically infinitely, it continually calls it. So in our setup, we set our uh, LED, the onboard LED to an output so we can blink it. But here is the meat, uh, if you will, of our application. Really, really simple. We're going to use the wire library here. And we're going to say begin on this bus address. And then I'm going to hook up two callbacks one for receive and one for request receive is when the controller does a write receive will get called with the data that was written on request it will call it when the uh, controller calls read and it will tell me how many bytes that the controller has requested in our case it will always be four bytes again for simplicity doing things uh, that are very square arrays makes life a whole lot easier. This way, I don't even need to worry about what that number is. In my callbacks, when I get that right, so here's the I squared C receive, when the controller sends that piece of information to me, that single byte, which is our register, we're just going to store that into here by calling read. That just brings one byte off of the bus. Then when we have a read request, it's going to look at that piece of data and then switch. So what that means is we could actually write, say, register two, and then I can do multiple reads. I can continually read it and it will always bring back register two until I write a different register into here. That's just the behavior I've put in here. It's actually fairly common to also see devices that when you do a read, it automatically increments the register number or ones that are configurable where it will auto advance or not based on a setting that you've put in. But if we look over here at the I squared C request, again, this is when the meadow does a read, it's going to look at whatever the last value that we received for a register number. And then we're going to write back. The wire library lets us write text directly, so I didn't have to do this as bytes. I could have done this as a byte array, but I'm being lazy. So we write back, you know, 0, 1, 2, or these Xs. Again, four bytes the same. It makes it much, much easier. You can do different lengths for different registers, but it becomes far more complex in the code if you're doing that. And then in my loop, that again, just uh, this is how Arduino works. It runs infinitely. It runs once. And then uh, the system continually calls it. It's going to write the LED state and then change the state and wait a second. So basically, we've got a one hertz blink of the onboard LED that just tells us that it's alive. All right. So let's go take a look at this physically, how I have it hooked up. You can see I have the Meadow F7 Feather here and an Arduino. This is a Uno R3. I have just two wires. These are the communication wires. The power and ground are through the USB to my PC. Ideally, I probably would have connected the at least the ground between the two of them. 
so that we have a coupled ground. But I know that since they're both coming off of my PC, the grounds go right back to the to the PC, and they are uh, actually common there. If I was to field this solution, I would connect those together. What I've got is I've got the SCL and SDA, which is the typical nomenclature for the serial clock and serial data. So the clock to clock, data to data, between the two. And that's it. That's as simple as it gets. In some cases, you do need pull-up resistors on these lines in order to make sure that the uh, wave on the line is nice and square. Again, you can read about the characteristics of the bus. I can put a link down below to the TI thing, but if you just do a search for I squared C, you will come up with lots and lots of resources. In this case, I don't need the resistors, but in some peripherals, you do. Let's deploy and run this application on the Arduino. You can see it uploaded. We had some transmit and receive lights blinking here when it uh, uh, pushed the data over. And then this is our one hertz blinking LED. So now if we take a look at the Meadow application. So now I'll just deploy this application to the Meadow. You can see the meadow is coming up here in the output. I probably could have done something similar like blinking the LED, but we've got this output, so I didn't uh, bother. You can see that what we've got is it wrote a zero and it read back uh, bytes that uh, are the text zero and wrote one, read back one, two, and then three got back four X's and then it goes back to the beginning. It'll just sit here and do this loop forever, as long as they've both got power. And that's it for today. I just wanted to provide a quick primer on how you can use a coprocessor from a Meadow. Again, it's a contrived example and pretty simple, but I hope it gives you an idea of how this works and how you might be able to use that in your solution. If you've got any comments or questions, go ahead and leave them down below. Otherwise, thank you for watching.